Anybody excited about Easter? We love Easter Sunday morning and what it represents, what we get to celebrate today. And we get to celebrate today that our God, our Savior, is not dead, but He actually is alive. That He is not in the tomb anymore. The tomb is empty and that Jesus Christ has resurrected from the grave. And because of that, the grave no longer has a grip on us because we are in the grip of His sufficient grace, which is sufficient for you and for me. And today is just a celebration. You know, I know sometimes we come in here and we talk about the cross and, the, you know, how He was beaten and how, you know, and all that. And I think that that's good and I think we've got to do that. But hey, that was Good Friday. It's Sunday. And today is the day we celebrate that He got up from the grave and grave could not hold him and he defeated death and hell took the keys and gave us victory that is found in placing our faith in him and the resurrection is about Jesus pursuing each and every one of you last week we talked about how Jesus's love for us is demonstrated when uh, there's 99 sheep that have been left in the field and he said hey if there's one missing out of a hundred and I'm gonna leave 99 and I'm going to actually chase after the one and that is what the resurrection is about that's what Easter is about it's him leaving the 99 behind and pursuing you chasing you down to get a hold of your heart to speak to you and to appear to you today and I'm telling you he's as real as me standing before you today I'm not playing games with us today this is our King Jesus and he is in our midst and God when he raised Jesus from the grave he did not do it in secret he is not hiding from humanity. He sent Jesus to be born of a virgin through a virgin womb and all the way 33 years later to the empty tomb. He revealed himself, who he was, that he was the son of God. He died a sinner's death even though he was perfect and sinless. He took your place on the cross and this Easter is when we get to celebrate that he got up again from the grave and they uh, they did not take his body. They Nobody, you know, uh, stole him like he got up from the dead. And Jesus, on the third day, did not rise up in secret. He appeared to many people. Did you know that he actually spent 40 days after he got up from the grave appearing to hundreds of of people so that people would know this is not a hoax this is the real deal you saw me dead on the cross lifeless but now God by the power of the Holy Spirit has raised me from the grave and now I'm appearing to hundreds of people it's why we are here today because Jesus left heaven pursued us chased us down he died for us and then he has revealed himself and appeared to us and given us hope for something greater than the grave and hell and death. He's given us eternal life. Anybody grateful for eternal life, man, that just goes forever and ever. And he did all of this to prove to you that there is a better life on the other side of this life. And it's eternal in a place, a real place called heaven that never ends. And it's only found in the person of Jesus. One of the most amazing teachings of the resurrection is actually not even found in the Gospels. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15. Many scholars, you read their books, they'll say that 1 Corinthians 15 actually might be one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible, especially when it comes to the resurrection and the crucifixion of Jesus. And this um, snippet of the resurrection, this account actually comes from Paul a little bit further down the road and Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he's trying to reassure them of what they've already believed because he's taught them about the resurrection of Jesus that Jesus died was buried in a borrowed tomb was raised on the third day and they believed and they placed their faith in Jesus but then there are some people that have come in and begin to plant seeds of doubt and so Paul is writing back to them to let them know hey what you believed in the first place was real and I want to reassure you of the resurrection of Jesus. And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. And if you've got your Bible, you want to open that up. 1 Corinthians 15, you can highlight, take some notes. If you don't have your Bible with you in the seat, we actually put the scriptures up on the screen every week so that you have the biggest Bible in the room. Hello, that's awesome. Uh, so don't worry about that. You can follow along on 
the screen. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Ready. Here we go. Now, brothers and sisters, again, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, so we're reading another person's mail. He says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which uh, you have taken your stand. In other words, you had your moment where you placed your faith in him. By this gospel, you were saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. What Paul is saying here is that the resurrection of the dead is our linchpin. It is our cornerstone. It is everything. If you don't believe in the resurrection, everything you've believed up until now is in vain. If you miss out on the resurrection, <clears throat> if you don't believe in the resurrection, then everything else doesn't matter. That's what he's saying here. Verse 3, he says, for what I received, I pass on to you as of, check it out, first importance. In other words, this is important, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then he appeared to the twelve. You see, he starts to appear to all these people after he gets up from the grave. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, Jesus appeared to 500 people. He, in fact, appeared to over 500 people, and many of them are actually still alive. You know, some of them have passed on. They're, they've fallen asleep, but if you don't believe me, go find one of these 470 people that are still alive and you can ask them if they saw Jesus with their own eyes and I'm telling you they saw Jesus get up come back from the grave he really is who he says he is verse 7 it says then he appeared to James which is actually his brother we'll come back to that then to the all the apostles and last of all Paul says he appeared to me as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Anybody, you know, relating to this? Because I persecuted the church of God, but, because, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. Has the gospel changed anybody's lives in here today? It's still powerful. And Paul said it started on Easter morning when Jesus got up from the grave. And the first person he decided to seek out to pursue, he actually chased down Peter. Which I just want, when I'm reading this this week, I'm going, thank you for doing that. Thank you for chasing and pursuing Peter because I feel like I'm Peter. Peter was one of these guys that he would always make promises to God, right? And I I will never deny you. I will never let you down. I will die for you, right? I mean, this is Peter. Peter represents the person who wants to so badly measure up, but it seems like they always continue to fall short of the glory of God. And Peter says, I will never deny you, Jesus. And then Jesus is arrested, and just hours later, what happens? These girls and these women from uh, the village come and they ask, hey, I think that you were one of his disciples. Weren't you with him? He's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Second lady asks him, third lady, and he finally just gets to the point where he just shouts and cusses and just says, I don't know him. And the rooster crows and It hits him, and he remembers the moment where Jesus told him that for the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter feels like he let Jesus down and that he denied Jesus. And it's like if anybody needs a resurrection, it's Peter, right? And so Jesus is resurrected from the dead. The first person he seeks out is Peter, because Peter needs some resurrecting in his life. Peter needs the grace of God in his life. And Peter is thinking in this moment, this is like the worst thing ever. He's looking in the mirror going, I'm worthless, man. I like, I made too many mistakes. I mean, I told Jesus I would never doubt him. And then I doubted him three times, like right after I told him that. Like, man, I'm the worst. Have you ever been there? Have you ever looked in the mirror and just thought, man, I am the worst 
of the worst. Like, I feel like I've just made too many mistakes. And I'm telling you, that's Peter. And Peter uh, was appeared to by Jesus, who was crucified, who was scorned. And Jesus shows up at the Sea of Galilee. If you ever go to Israel with me, I'll take you to this very spot that Jesus appeared to Peter. And he just told him, I love you, I forgive you, and I'm going to turn you from a fisherman into a shepherd. And you are going to fish for people. I want you to know I love you. And I want the world to know that I'm chasing you down. I'm pursuing you, Peter, because I want everybody to know that ever reads about this story that I'm a God who loves people who fall short and who make mistakes and who mess up. But it's not the end for you. I'm chasing you down because I still got a plan for your life. I still got a calling and a destiny, and it's great. And I'm telling you, your failure is not final. I've got incredible, immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine in store for you. And that's why I love that he went after Peter. Thank you for going after Peter for, so that I could have somebody to relate to. And so he appears to Peter, and then he appears to his disciples. And then he appears to 500 people. Then he appears to some family. Then he appears to the apostles. And then lastly, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 8. It says, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What does this mean, abnormally born? It means that Paul, like you and I, wasn't around for the crucifixion. Wasn't around to see Jesus actually get up from the grave. Was not there with the Marys who kind of saw, you know, Jesus, you know, wasn't there and he appeared to them. And wasn't there when the angels kind of rolled the stone away. Like he wasn't there in the moment when everybody was scurrying around and was making headlines that Jesus has risen from the grave. He's saying, I didn't see any of that with my own eyes. But what I do know is that on the road to Damascus, Jesus finally appeared to me, and he chased me down, and that's the message of Easter, is you don't have to be there and see it physically with your own eyes, that actually Paul is not the last person that Jesus appeared to, because there are many of you who Jesus has appeared to just even in the last couple of weeks, maybe even in the last couple of months, maybe even in the last year or two, Jesus has become real to you because you had a moment where he appeared to you. And that's the message of Easter because of the resurrection. Jesus is alive and he's just going around appearing to you and appearing to you and he's appeared to me and he's appearing to us and he's letting you know he is the real deal and he he is who he said he is. And Jesus is not done appearing to people. And in fact, it's the reason, the mission that God is on is to appear to some of you today for the very first time. I'm not talking about intellectual, like I know Jesus is a historic figure and he's a good man, a religious teacher, social activist, and he kind of lived, and yes, he split time, and they began to do the calendar differently like when he came, but I'm talking about these questions right here are for you. There are two questions that you must answer, that you come to a fork in the road, and there's no gray area. It's either you're all in or you're all out on these questions, and everybody must answer this question at some point in your life if you haven't already, but you've got to answer these questions for you, and they are personal, and they have nothing to do with preference. It's either the truth or it's a hoax, and it's this question, these questions right here. Number one, is Jesus Lord? And then the second question is, did Jesus rise from the dead? And you have to answer that question. And there is not, you know, preferences to kind of lean into, only truth to be believed. And do you believe these truths? Romans 10.9 says this, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Those two questions, what you feel about them, how you answer them, what you believe about them, will determine whether you spend eternity in a place called hell or a place called heaven. Both places are real and everybody spends eternity in one of those two places. 
and how you answer those questions. Is Jesus Lord? And did Jesus rise from the dead make all the difference as to where you will spend eternity forever? No gray area. This is the point where the message of Christianity is radically different than any other religion. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? That he really is who he said he was, the Son of God? And do you believe that Jesus, without a shadow of a doubt, got up from the grave, rose from the grave, conquered death, defeated hell, this pivotal moment for some of us in here today who find ourselves at the fork in the road and we got to decide which direction are we going to go? How are we going to believe? And I just came to tell you today that I believe without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is Lord and that he got up from the grave, that he is risen. And I know this. I know that I know that I know you can't take it away from me. You can't talk me out of it. I know because he appeared to Peter and he appeared to 500 other people and he appeared to his disciples and to the apostles and to his brother, James. I mean, I want you to think about this. What would you have to do to convince your brother that you are the son of God and you rose from the grave. Oh, I want my brother to come tell me those things, right? And like, see, like, you know how your family is some of the hardest people to convince of anything, right? And you're like, man, somebody else needed to speak this into them because I'm just too close to them, right? Like, we've all said that. Like, I'm just too close to them to lead them or give them advice. They won't listen to me because we're family, so I need somebody else to tell them. That's what Jesus encountered as well. Yet James, the brother of Jesus, believed that his brother, Jesus, was the son of God and that he had risen from the grave. That's huge evidence. And so not only did he appear to James, not only did he appear to the apostles, not only did he appear to Paul, but I'm come to tell you this morning that he is not done appearing to people. And on November 20th, 1994, on sitting on a church pew one Sunday morning, Jesus overwhelmingly appeared to me. And it was the most emotional, powerful experience of my life. And I'm not just saying this because you feel like, man, I need to say it. I'm telling you, I was there in this moment. And this is the moment that I'm grateful for parents who made sure that their boys were in church every chance they got because they did not want us to miss out on our opportunity when God would speak. We were there. We were positioned. And man, yes, did, were they legalistic? No. Did we miss every now and then, sure, but I'm going to tell you what, on a consistent, committed basis, me and my brother were in the house of God, and I was 12 years old in 1994, and the guy up there speaking, he just began to talk about Jesus and how uh, he, he had had nails driven through his hands and a crown of thorns crushed on his head, and that he had done all this. He had walked the road, he had carried the cross, he had been beaten and flogged and spat upon and mocked and made fun of, and he did it all for me. And then he told me that actually Jesus really didn't even, you know, want to do it in the garden. But then he said, if this is your will, God, then I'll do it because I love you and I love people. And I just, in that moment, man, it was real to me. And I just was overcome with emotion and the presence of God and the Holy Spirit just filled me. And I was 12 years old sitting in a little church pew, man, and that was my moment when Jesus became real to me and he appeared to me. And then they sang this little Christian song that was, I'll never forget it. It was a song like back in the 90s, some Christian song called What Sin? And it was like written uh, almost like from Jesus' perspective to the sinner. And the chorus words were this, what sin? What sin? That's as far away as the east is from the west. What sin, what sin, it was gone the very moment you confessed, buried in the sea of forgetfulness. And I'll never just remember in that moment, I stood to my feet in that church and I said, Jesus, I want to give my 
life to you. A 12-year-old boy. Now, you might be thinking, well, man, Pastor, you kind of got a head start. You, you know, you came to Christ when you were 12, and I'm 45, and, you know, I just feel like I've wasted so many years. Did you know that Paul spent the first 33 years of his life killing and persecuting Christians? And it wasn't until the age of 33 that Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and changed his life and changed his direction. So I know you might be a little older, but can I just tell you and speak this over with you? God's not done with you. God's got a plan for you. He's got a destiny for you, and he can do more in a year with you than what you could do on your own in 33, 45, 67 years. Your story's not done yet. In fact, maybe today your story is just beginning as God is going to appear to you just like he did on, to me that day. And it was on that day that I just abandoned religion altogether. And I began a relationship with Jesus. I want you to write some of these things down. These are just to wrap our minds around some of this stuff when it comes to religion. <clears throat> Religion always starts with us loving God, but Christianity starts with God first loving us. Anybody grateful that God did not wait until we loved him for him to love us, but when we were dead in our sins, lost in our transgressions, he sent Jesus to die. He was rich in mercy even when we couldn't find our way, man. He loved us even when we didn't love him. And so uh, on that day that... He appeared to me. I walked in that church that morning, and I didn't know if I believed in God or not. But in that moment, I realized that God, this whole time, has believed in me. And so I don't know where you find yourself today. I can't speak for everybody in here. I don't know if everybody, you know, some people in here, uh, where you're at with God and what you believe about him. But what I can tell you unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, is how he feels about you. And he loves you. You are valuable, and you are beautiful to him, and he's just trying to get your attention this morning to lead you into the great destiny that he has for you, because his ways are higher than our ways, and his ways are massively better than our ways, and if you'll give your life to him today, I'm telling you, it will be the greatest decision of your life, and so I can't say for everybody in here that you love God, but I can say unequivocally that God loves Without a shadow of a doubt, that's how he feels about you. In fact, 1 John 4.10 says this, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Religion always starts with us loving God, but our faith, Jesus, Christianity always starts with God loving us. Number two, religion says that we must work ourselves up to God. But Jesus says, I already came down to you. Amen. See, this is where every other religion is separated from our faith and our relationship with Jesus. Because every other religion is, man, you gotta, you got to work yourself up. you got to earn your way up. you got to climb the spiritual ladder. And hopefully, at the end of it all, you've done enough, and you've helped enough, and you've achieved enough to be able to get into an eternity uh, of, of something, right? And it's just like religion is this huge gamble, a gamble that I'm not willing to take. And Jesus is saying, it's not about you earning your way up or measuring up. In fact, the reason... I came down is because you don't measure up and I love you enough. I love that I say it like this. Jesus came from the top to the bottom to bring you from the bottom to the top. His grace is sufficient for you. It's sufficient for me. And because he came down, I'm going to get to go up. Amen. And he came to do God's will. He came to serve. He came to give his life for a ransom for many. He came to be a king. He came to, that I might have life to the fullest. He came that, to conquer death and hell and the grave. But the greatest reason that for me on why he came is found in Luke 19.10. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He 
came to seek and save the lost. Have you ever lost something that's very valuable? Isn't that one of the most frustrating things when you can't find your phone or you can't find your keys and you got to be somewhere and it's lost and it's just very, very frustrating? It's amazing the things we will do for the things in our lives that are lost, that are valuable to us. I'll never forget a friend of mine telling me this ridiculous story, and this might be TMI for Easter, but oh well, we're going to go for it. It's Rescue House. And he was just telling me about how he was on this road trip, and he really had to use the restroom. And so he gets off in this, like, you know, weird exit, and it's like there's one gas station. Come on, we've all been there. And you like, there's one bathroom. It's just like a free-for-all. Like, everybody's been in there, your mother and everybody. And you just kind of walk in, and it's like you walk in, and you get what you get, right? Like, I mean, it's like... Like, this is it. And if you got to go, you got to go. And so he's like doing his thing, trying to prepare, trying to like fix it where it's not all nasty. And in the process with everything even in there and just the whole nasty thing, he drops his phone in the toilet. <clears throat> and immediately, without even thinking about it, he reached down and surrendered. And got his phone. Why? Because his phone is very valuable to him. Can I just tell you today, I don't know if this is going to touch anybody or not, probably not. (laughs) But can I just tell you, Jesus left heaven and came to this toilet bowl called earth. And he reached down. He pursued. He came after you in the muck and the mire. And he lifted you up out of the pit because you are valuable. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're valuable. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I guess you're valuable too. (laughs) And while we're at it, just turn to the person behind you and just say, I sure do look better than you today. Go ahead and just tell them, because you've been wanting to say it anyways all morning. And I've lost the sermon. Okay, all right, back. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was Lost. Mark 2, 17 says this, I have come. Jesus has not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And on that day, walking into church in November 20, 1994, I was a sinner. And if you never see yourself as a sinner, you'll never know that you have a need for a Savior. And in that moment, it was life-changing for me. And Christ's love hit me for the first time, and it was over. And in that moment, I gave my life to him. And my life has never been the same since. Number three, religion is summed up with the word do. Christianity is summed up with the word done. Religion is all about doing. But Jesus comes along, and it's about what he has done. Similar words, only two-letter difference, but a revolutionary way that we look at Life. Religion is about do, 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 and if you make a mistake, what do you need to do to make it up to God, and have you done enough, and when you die, you get before him, you better make sure that you have done enough. That's religion, but I'm telling you, a relationship with Jesus, Jesus is telling you, it is done. It's already finished. I paid for your sins. I died for you on the cross for you and for me. His death, his sacrifice was enough payment, enough atonement for your sin, my shame, your guilt. And when he died, he uttered these words, it is, say it with me, finished. It is finished. Religion is working your way up to God. And Jesus said, nah, it's finished. No longer is it about working your way up to God. It's I came down to be the sin offering so that you may have life, so that you may have life, so that you, sir, may have life. And yes, even you, so that you might have life. I'm telling you, your sin can be over today. If you'll give your life to him, if you'll realize that he is here, that he is appearing before us today. What's crazy is God knows everything you have done. He knows the things that you've acted upon. He knows the things that you wish you had, would have done, the peace that you wish you had, the hell that you have been through, the disappointments that you have faced. 
He knows the challenges that are ahead. But he shouted from the cross on that day, over 2,000 years ago, it is finished. It is done. And because of what he has done has trumped anything you have done. And so I don't care what your story is up until this point. Nothing you've done can trump what he's done. He says it is finished. And in this moment today, you can give your life to him. You don't have to wait for 10 years down the road till you feel like I can clean myself up. That's not your job. Your job is to be obedient to the moment and let Jesus come into your life and clean you up. And if you'll do that, your life will be forever changed. I don't have this one on the screen, but you can write it down. Religion tries to make you good, but Jesus came to make you alive. See, I want you to know today that Jesus didn't just come and die on the cross to make bad people good. He came, died on a cross to make dead people come alive. And there's a massive difference. Massive difference. Because good people don't get into heaven. Forgiven people get into heaven. People who have placed their faith in Jesus and who have come alive in him. I love what Billy Graham said a long time ago, but just came to fruition just recently. He said this, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. Can you feel his assurance? See, religion is a gamble, but a relationship with Jesus brings assurance. And you can know that you know that you know today that when you die and you pass from this earth physically, that spiritually you will never die. And you'll be having a conversation with Jesus 600 and 37,000 years down the road being, hey, remember that one time? <laughs> because eternity is forever. And Jesus is on a mission today to pursue you, to chase you down, and let you know he is who he said he was, that he is Lord, and that he really did rise from the grave. And maybe God is thinking that somebody here this morning might would have a story that sounded something like this. Yeah, my mom, she's, she's a follower of Jesus, and she said she would always pray for me. And my brother, he kind of gave his life to Christ and did that whole spiritual stuff a long time ago, and he's just an awesome man. I mean, he's a great man of faith. And my cousin, she's a, she's a believer, and she just exudes joy. It's kind of crazy. She's one of my favorite people to be around because she's just so joyful. It doesn't matter what's going on. She just has this joy that she kind of says comes from Jesus, and Janet, my coworker, who just kind of works across the aisle at work, she's kind of the same way. She just she works really hard and she's really good at what she does. And when you talk to her about it, she just somehow gives Jesus all the glory. She just kind of talks about it. Janet does, and I really think she's a good person. And, and then I remember when my college buddy called me and. We had been through a lot together, and he just phoned me up one day. We hadn't talked in a couple months, and he just said, man, you're not going to believe what hap um, happened to me because, like, you know, we've been through it, man. Like, all the girls, all the spring breaks, man, the parties. and But I just had to call you today because something happened to me. Today, I got saved. I was like, wow, like, I never thought, like, you <laughs> would get saved. No, no offense, but I just, you know, didn't see that one coming. And he's like, man, it was real. And he 
just said, man, my, this is real to me as anything ever has happened in my life. It, and I just I had to call you and tell you, yeah, I know we haven't been perfect, but the other day when I gave my life to Jesus, it was the greatest day of my life. And another buddy of mine, I was just kind of walking, and I saw him in Walmart, and we just began to talk, and I could tell he was like a little emotional, and he just, he began to tell me about how his life has just kind of changed over the last, even just few weeks. He said he was like down and depressed, and even though people thought stuff was going good on the outside, man, stuff on the inside was just turmoil, and he didn't know where he was at in life. And, and he told me right there in Walmart that Jesus changed his life. And that he had asked God for forgiveness. And that in a moment, God gave him a brand new start and a do-over. And I began to think, man, like, that's something I need in my life. And then what was crazy, you're not going to believe this, but my wife sat me down over dinner one night. She had something she wanted to tell me. And she just began to speak, and she said, you know, honey, how I've been going to this Bible study, and I've been going for a couple weeks, and this week we, we talked specifically about this Jesus guy. And how, yes, he was a religious teacher and a social activist and a morally good religious man, but they told me he was more than that. They told me he was the son of the living God. And then they began to describe what he did for me. That he bled for me. And that he died for me. And that my place was on the cross, but he decided to take my place and I'm telling you honey I was in the middle of that Bible study and my heart was beating out of my chest and the presence of God was so thick and it was overwhelming and it was emotional and then somebody some lady in the Bible study just spoke up and said is there anybody here that wants to come to know Jesus tonight, you can know this Jesus guy. That all you have to do is come as you are. And I'm telling you, honey, I mean, you know about the marriage before this one. And you know about our struggles. And you know about what our kids have been through. And you know about all that we've been through. And I'm just telling you right there in that living room, in that Bible study, I gave my life to this Jesus guy. And it was the most real thing. It was him appearing to me. And I asked him to forgive me and to wash me white as snow, to give me a brand new life. And that was my moment. That's how I know that God really is who he said he was because he appeared to me. And then I remember I was out playing golf with my buddy and it was a little awkward because he's awkward. And I could tell there was something he wanted to talk to me about the whole round and he kind of waited till we were done. And then he just looked at me and said, hey, I've just been wanting to just talk to you about something real quick. He said, you know, like, I go to this church called Rescue House, and you know, we're having Easter services on Sunday morning, and I just, you know me, you know I'm not perfect, and you know I don't have it all together, but I just would really like it if you would come. And then he told me he might even take me out for a beer afterwards, and I was like, okay, well, And he had asked me before, and I just thought, it's Easter. I think that I'll, I'll go this time. So I show up to this. They say it's a campus, but it was like a school. And I pulled in, and I see like all these, these parkers, and they're kind of a little over-happy. I don't know what's going on there. And, <laughs> and I kind of come in, and somebody hands me a pack and just kind of welcomes me in. And, 
don't quite know what to think, and there's music going, and if somebody gets me a seat, and I just kind of sit down, and I'm just kind of, you know, overly, like, observing everything, and then you kind of open up with this video, and then all of a sudden we start singing Christian karaoke, it's kind of weird, uh, <laughs> they didn't really highlight the words like I needed them to, but we sang some songs, and and then this guy, this young guy, gets up there with this kind of different haircut than I'm used to, dressed a little bit like an Easter egg, <laughs> and he begins to tell me about this real man named Jesus, and how that this man Jesus really is the son and how this son of God actually died for me. And that my sin was supposed to put me on a cross and put me on a path to death and destruction, but because of what Jesus did for me, I mean, he just starts talking about all this, and I'm just, I'm not really knowing what's going on, and then all of a sudden, what my wife starts talking, was talking to me about, and what my friends, it just all starts coming back to me, and I'm going, oh my goodness, this is happening to me. Jesus is appearing to me and he's letting me know that he is real and that he loves me and that I am valuable to him and yes I'm not the sum of my mistakes but he has a great purpose on me and I'm telling you in that moment my chest like my wife started to beat out of it and I didn't know quite what was going on I was overwhelmed with emotion and I'm telling you this was my moment and the time my story was written into the story of God. I just wonder, is that somebody's story here today? That God orchestrated everything up until this point to bring you to this moment that you would say yes to him. I believe that Jesus is Lord. And I believe that Jesus has risen from the grave. You say, well, you still haven't really, like, proved to me that, like, Jesus actually got up from the grave. Well, there's a lot of things I could go into today, but I'm not. But the main one, there's actually two. One is when he appeared to his disciples, there were 12 of them. He appeared to them, told them, I've died to give you life, to give everybody life. And your role is now to take this message. Will you live for this message, this gospel? And after he appeared to them, they went out and they took this message to the world. And 11 out of 12, 11 out of the 12 died a martyr's death because of that message. And I don't care who you are, there's nobody under the sound of my voice today who will die for a hoax, for something that is not real. But 11 out of the 12 saw Jesus rise from the dead and they said I'll give my life for that and they literally gave their life some of them crucified upside down killed martyred because they saw with their own eyes that Jesus is risen from the dead and then number two I've been there I've been to the tomb I've looked in the tomb and can I just I just come to tell you He's not in there. That he has risen from the grave. And that's what separates every other religion from our faith. You can go to Muhammad's grave. And go visit him if you want. You can go to Joseph Smith's grave. You can go to any religious leader. You can go to their grave. And you will find their casket and their bodies. But you go to the grave of my Savior. And he is not there. Because he has risen. And he is alive in us. And the Bible says very clear in Romans 10, 9. Come on, this is where you got to lean in. Very clear, very simple. 
If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I'm going to give you a chance, an opportunity. Some of you right now, you're at the fork in the road, and you've got to decide, do I believe that he is Lord and that he's risen from the grave, or do I think it's all a hoax? Because there's no gray area. There's no, I think Jesus is a good moral teacher. He's either Lord or he's a liar or a lunatic. You can't be just good because of what he claimed to be. And so I'm going to give you a chance at the fork in the road to make your decision. And can I just tell you, you're not promised another moment like this to make this decision. So why would you bow out and be like, well, I think I might try again. You don't know. This is your moment to give your life to Jesus. Why would you back out on that? Come on, let's do some business with God. Every head bow, every eye closed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now I've spoken your word, and I just pray your Holy Spirit would draw us to you. Holy Spirit, do your work. Jesus, would you appear to those that need saving right now? As we're praying all over this location, it's very simple. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you know that, man, God is appearing to you today and that this is my moment. This is why God brought me here and I want to give my life to Christ and I want a do-over. I want a brand new start. I want my sins to be forgiven. Or I want an eternal home in heaven and I need to make this decision for myself. This is not granny's decision, my mom's decision, my daughter, my son's decision, a husband, wife. This is my decision to follow Jesus and to cross from death to life. And if you will pray this prayer silently in your heart after me, and it expresses the sincere desire of your heart, just like that, you will be saved. The Bible says if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here we go. Don't back out. That's why God brought you here today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. But I believe, Jesus, that you are Lord. And right now, Jesus, I repent of my sin, and I turn from my way, and I want to follow your way. Right now, Jesus, I give my life to you. I believe that you came to this earth. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe on the third day that you rose from the grave. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me and to wash me of all my sin, past, present, and future. And I promise to live for you all the days of my life, the best way I know how. With every head bow, with every eye closed if you just prayed that prayer today and it was the real deal man you crossed from death to life and that was your moment that nobody can take that away from you that on april 1st 2018 is the day that salvation was planted in your heart and you became the righteousness of god and i'm just going to ask you to take it one step further, I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I want you to just shoot your hand in the air with no hesitation, holding nothing back to just say, I'm with God, and today was my moment. And I just don't be ashamed. The uh, Bible says if you're ashamed of God, he'll be ashamed of you, man. And you're not ashamed. You've got the courage of Christ just to lift your hand in this morning. And I'm going to pray for you, and I want to see you own this decision that I'm with Jesus. Here we go. Don't back out of it. One, two, three. Three, come on, if you prayed that prayer this morning, come on, lift your hand high, high in the air. It's amazing. Yes, come on, leave it high in the air. It's amazing. Yes, I see you. I want to pray for you, every hand that's in the air. It's awesome. Jesus sees you right now. He sees your faith. You are saved by the blood of Jesus. Let me pray for you as your hand is still in the air. Heavenly Father, God, I pray for those that have come into the family of God right now. God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for appearing to them. 
just like you appeared to me, just like you appeared to the apostles. God, I pray right now that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you would consume them, that you would give them a new start, a do-over, God, and that you would put a new song in their mouth, make them a new creation. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that as they become a part of the family of God, I pray that they would become a part of this church family. And I pray, Father, that um, we would be able to walk beside of them in all of their journey with you, God. And I pray that they would become fully devoted followers, fully devoted disciples of you, God, that this is just the beginning of their story. God, I pray that you would use them to do immeasurably more than they could ask or imagine. God, whatever calling, purpose, or destiny you have on their life, God, I pray that you would make it known. <clears throat> make it known to them, God. And we thank you, God, for sending Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, let's clap our hands. Hands up all over the room today. Come on, all of heaven is rejoicing when one sinner comes to repentance. It's amazing, isn't it? Happy Easter.